Hello and welcome to The Leading Question. I'm your host, Steve Wigreiser. Heart disease is the number one killer of Americans. And today's leading question, how can we avoid acquiring this potentially lethal disease? And in the event that we have heart disease, what are some of the medical strategies that are available to deal with it? Uh, to help us answer these questions and more, we have one of the Delaware Valley's leading heart doctors, Dr. Peter Freshy. Peter, hello and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Let's talk a little bit about your background, where you went to school, and where you practice. I grew up in Havertown. I went to Kenyon College, a liberal arts school in Gambier, Ohio. And I'm cardiology trained at Temple University. Okay. Finished my training in 1990. And I see that you're also fellowship trained. I did a fellowship in interventional cardiology there. The term cardiology, what does that refer to? Cardiology refers to the heart. And the heart is a pump. And the pump serves to pump blood to our kidneys, our intestinal tract, our brain and keep us going. And why did you decide to get involved with cardiology of all the medical fields and specialties that were available? As a medical student, we went through all the different specialties, gastrointestinal, neurology, ENT, ophthalmology, and I enjoyed the heart. My mentor uh, was uh, Michael Kirschbaum, now deceased, but he was a great teacher of students, and uh, he got me very much interested in the subject, and that's how it started as a third-year medical student. Now, if that's cardiology, what is interventional cardiology? Interventional cardiology are the tools to diagnose and fix problems. I do right and left heart catheterizations, I measure pressures on the right side of the heart. I look at the blood vessels that feed the heart. I look at the valves on the right side and left side of the heart. But if someone's having a heart attack, I bring them in quickly and open up a blockage. I was under the impression, I think many of our viewers were under the impression that uh, most physicians are affiliated with or have privileges with one hospital. But when I looked at your professional resume or curriculum vitae, it looks like you work at more than one hospital. Where are you working these days? In 1990 when I came out, I joined five other cardiologists in practice and over time our practice became 20 cardiologists covering multiple hospitals. We would have a pod at Jefferson Tourist Sale, we would have a pod at Jeans Fox Chase, and we had a pod at Albert Einstein Medical Center. But ultimately in 2000, we moved the Einstein pod up to Jefferson Abington. So now, I, at this point in my career, I've consolidated. I spend my time at Abington Jefferson. You talked about the left side and the right side of the heart. Um, we, we all understand that the heart is a pump and circulates blood. But when you make the distinction between right side and left side, can you give us a Reader's Digest version of how the heart works. The blood returns to the heart on the right side. It's a low pressure chamber, but it pushes the blood through the lungs to get oxygenated and then sent to the left side of the heart, which is a higher pressure chamber pump to push the blood out to the brain and the other organs in the body. All the tissue in the body, I assume, needs oxygen rich blood to, to live. Absolutely. Okay, so the left side circulates it throughout the body. Mm -hmm. The right side, at a lower pressure, circulates it within the lung to pick up oxygen. Correct. There's a term that we all use, and we may misuse, you'll tell us, uh, heart attack. When, when a layperson such as myself talks about a heart attack, what, what are we really talking about, and, and what happens to us? There are different kinds of heart attacks, but the classic heart attack is someone, male or female, 
over the age of 40 who has pressure in their chest, shortness of breath, a discomfort up into their jaw or into their arm classically, something different about what's going on or an indigestion that may very well be due to a narrowing, a buildup of cholesterol in one of the major arteries that feed the heart. The pump has a blood supply, three major arteries, the right, feeds the lower surface, the anterior descending feeds the front of the heart, and the circumflex artery feeds the lateral part, so that the three-dimensional heart pump gets a blood supply. When someone's having chest pain, it may very well be due to either spasm, narrow, like a squeezing of the blood vessel, due to a buildup of plaque in the artery. Okay. And that, that can cause the symptoms and very well may cause damage to the heart downstream because it blocks flow and there's restriction of flow and oxygenated blood to that part of the heart and that's a heart attack that's classic i'm assuming there are other presentations that we can talk about people can have stress-induced heart attacks a signature event anniversary of a death a divorce going on or a moving situation or something with a spouse or a family member and that kind of stress can affect our brain our brain can stimulate catecholamines that cause the microcirculation to clamp down and maybe affect a particular part of the heart and cause a heart attack so it's true then that stress or at least extreme stress can kill Absolutely. But the classic heart attack is a situation where that, that oxygen-rich blood that we earlier uh, uh, mentioned was necessary for all tissue to live, I guess the heart muscle is no exception. So if the heart is not getting a, a good supply of blood, then tissue has the potential for being damaged. Correct. And the sooner you get to the hospital with symptoms, and the sooner you get medications and, and or if necessary, a catheterization and a stent, maybe the less damage to the heart muscle will ensue. I want to understand when we use the term heart disease, and I let off the show by indicating that that was the leading cause of death in the United States, but heart disease sounds like it's a pretty broad term. When we're talking about uh, a restriction of uh, blood flow in the coronary arteries, uh, are we talking about coronary artery disease? That specifically is coronary artery disease. Okay, and is that the leading cause of heart attacks? Most likely, yes. Let's focus on that for a moment because all of us are familiar with admonitions from uh, loved ones and, and, and medical journals of uh, all sorts, that we should avoid high cholesterol foods. Um, what, what are we talking about? What is the cause of this narrowing of the arteries? Your audience also mostly is in children or young people. Correct. So let's talk about the nutrition or the lack of good nutrition that leads to the buildup of cholesterol plaque narrowing in the arteries of the heart. Okay, let's do that because it sounds like there's something that we can do to avoid or lessen that problem. So let's talk about that. When we're born, our LDL cholesterol, a fractionation of the type of cholesterol within our blood, there are multiple fractions. There's good cholesterol that you've heard about, there's bad cholesterol, and there's just general cholesterol. Uh, when we are born, our LDL, our bad cholesterol, is like 35, very low. But over time, through dietary indiscretion, I'll say, cheese, ice cream, pizza, steak sandwiches, the many, many things that we love to eat. My favorites. The LDL cholesterol number builds up and gets higher. And over time, from age 20, onward into our 40s, continued dietary indiscretion uh, can lead to the buildup of plaque. Commonly, 
at the branch points of the arteries. I said there's a right coronary artery. Well, the right coronary artery gives off a couple branches. The circumflex artery feeding that ladder wall gives off a few branches. The left anterior descending artery gives off a few branches. When you have a heart attack or a buildup of cholesterol in any of those spots, it doesn't necessarily mean the more proximal front of that vessel is blocked off. It could be a downstream branch. It could be a side branch. It's interesting that bad cholesterol plaques build up commonly at branch points in the artery. And what is the significance of branch points in terms of problems or even mortality? Where the vessel is blocked has more significance. Further downstream is a smaller territory of a heart attack. Further upstream with a complete blockage is a bigger size heart attack. So heart attacks can vary in size and, it, and uh, severity and the sequelae of, of what's happening at that time. I want to know this. Is it possible uh, for an individual to have plaques or buildup of cholesterol and other fats and whatever else may make up uh, coronary artery disease in their coronary arteries, never know it, and live a long life? Absolutely. They could have a buildup of plaque in their carotid arteries or in a, a branch point in their vein and, and, and their first symptom could be their last symptom or a major stroke. The buildup of cholesterol plaque in our bodies doesn't necessarily only go to the heart. The risk factors for heart disease and vascular disease in general are age as we get older, family history, are there mother, father, brother, sister, uncles, aunts, grandparents that have heart disease or not, smoking, diabetes, uncontrolled sugars, having a milieu of high blood sugar in your body, hypertension, uncontrolled blood pressure over time. They're the major risk factor for artery disease throughout our body. People need to know what their cholesterol panel is. They need to go to their doctors. Everyone needs to go to a doctor. I meet multiple people who don't go to their doctors. They don't know what their cholesterol numbers are. They haven't had their blood pressure checked. I want to tell your audience to save their life. They need to eat healthy fruits, vegetables, poultry, fish. They need to exercise regularly. They need to find a good doctor who's going to take good care of them and be vigilant. Look at themselves in a the mirror and see how they want to be. See who's living into their 80s and 90s. It's not people that are out of shape, people that don't take care of themselves. The people that live old, they're lucky. They have good family histories. Their parents lived to be old. They weren't smokers. But it sounds like there may be a genetic predisposition to, Absolutely. to heart disease. Sure. The, yeah, our bodies are manufactured to to, to deal with cholesterol, the intake of sugar, how much insulin does your body produce, deal with the metabolism of cholesterol, do you have a ratio, is your body liver programmed to deal with the intake of fat to make it good, good cholesterol, or do they make bad cholesterol? And if they're, if they're genetically predisposed to make bad cholesterol, they have a higher risk of developing artery disease. Okay. And if we are going to our doctor for a yearly physical and we're getting blood work done uh, and whatever other tests may be appropriate, I guess we can discover whether we have risk factors for heart disease. And then what happens? Well, hopefully you have a good doctor. It's really incumbent upon having a good doctor who's going to aggressively treat you if you have a strong family history, if your cholesterol panel isn't in the more favorable range, who's going to admonish you if you're a smoker and tell you to stop smoking. Look carefully at your weight. All right, let's assume that we do the appropriate tests that the doctor prescribes, and it turns out we're at high risk for uh, either coronary order, artery disease or heart disease of some sort. Um, what can you do for such a person? There are excellent medicines out there. 
to lower cholesterol, to change the cholesterol ratio. There are statin medicines. Right. There's, we all know, generic Lipitor, Atorvastatin, Crestor. There are new medications that are injectable once or twice a month, PCSK9 inhibitors that can, if the cholesterol medicines don't do a good enough job, or there are side effects that are not uncommon from the cholesterol medicines with generalized muscle aches, uh, that can be utilized to lower cholesterol numbers. And it's not good enough for the family doctor or the even the cardiologist to say the LDL cholesterol of 85 is good, good enough for you. The American College of Cardiology and the European Society for Cardiology recommend very low LDL cholesterols under 60 milligrams per deciliter. So I look very carefully at the numbers and I really do try to aggressively treat that. In the old days when the guidelines weren't so stringent. We used to accept a total cholesterol under 200, then it was 175. In my letters for 25 years, I would write, the goal cholesterol is abysmally low. It was lower than whatever the guidelines were, but it had to be abysmally low. And it is, the numbers that I try to strive for in my patients is under 60 milligrams per deciliter. Because I see a lot of children of the patients Right. When I come out and I talk to a family member who had a heart attack and I did, did my, my stent job to whatever artery they did, I always look to see where the sons are or the daughters because that's the one I really want to talk about. I, I will take care of the patient, but I really, if I'm going to affect downstream, I want to get to the kid. So I tell them, and they're usually in their 20s or 30s, and I start to see them that if we're going to prevent this, this disease in you, then we have to start now. We have to start when they're in their 30s. Once you have uh, coronary artery disease, is there any way to reverse it? I haven't found that there's a pill, a rotor rooter that you can take, a Drano that dissolves it. Drano intake is not good, never was during any presidency recommended, during any pandemic, Drano is not recommended. There's a program which involves strict diet, healthy diet, 98% of the time, do the right thing, eat the good quality foods, don't have cholesterol intake. See the doctor, get on a cholesterol medicine and have abysmally low cholesterol to try to prevent the progression and maybe cause some regression. I do believe in regression of the disease. If the numbers can be abysmally low. Okay, like 40? That's excellent, that's what my numbers are. Okay, mine too. There's no reason not to have great lipid management at this point in time. Day in and day out, you do some pretty neat things with respect to the heart and heart disease. And I just wanna give those who are watching an idea as to what you do and how you do it. I love what I do. I, and I've been fortunate. I trained at Temple with some excellent guys, 1988 to 1990. I was one of the first osteopathic interventional cardiologists, the first five in the country in 88 to 90. At that point in time, we did balloon angioplasty of arteries. I did the first transplant radiation therapy for restenosis, which is a re-narrowing after you've opened them up. But what I do now, I do diagnostic right and left heart catheterizations. I define what the heart disease is. I do coronary stent to open up blockages in the setting of a heart attack or with stable angina. I do peripheral vascular work. If someone has narrowing of the major arteries of the leg, and they have discomfort when they walk. I can also open up that blockage. I've evolved my practice to do that with training. Since 2014 at Abington, we now do transaortic valve replacement, the valve that lets the blood out of the heart. In older people, narrows because it opens up at least 60 times per minute. And if you do that for 60, 70 years, sometimes you get a little lazy and tired. The standard of care in the past was a surgical replacement. Now we routinely in 
high, medium, and lower risk patients who are well can replace the valve through the leg. The people that I refer for open heart surgery have diffuse multivessel coronary artery disease that is not to their benefit being taken care of by stents. I do coronary work, peripheral work. I do aortic valve replacements with the team. And I also do a, a device called left atrial appendage closure with the watchman. You, we've all seen the commercials for the watchman. That's people have atrial fibrillation or have what they call paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It's a dysrhythmia of the heart, an irregularity of the heart. Some people have it, it comes and goes. Some people can have it permanently. But when you have that condition, you do need to be on a blood thinner. And as you get older, being on a blood thinner can be not to a patient's benefit because they have gastrointestinal disease, they have bleeding, they have ulcers, they fall, they have bruising, they're frail. I'm able to protect people with atrial fibrillation putting in this left atrial appendage closure device called the Watchman. The Watchman is a device that we go up through the right side of the heart. We're able to cross the inner atrial septum with a transeptal, it's another technique I do, to get into the left atrial appendage. It's a vestigial organ on the left side where 95% of the clots that cause a stroke from being in atrial fibrillation come from. And the watchman sort of, I'm gonna say this, is sort of like a little umbrella that goes at the mouth of that vestigial organ and closes it off so that the blood clots don't form or if they form, they're behind the umbrella. If you get right into the appendage and you get the depth that you need and you're at the right angle and you've done enough of them, the watchman is just excellent, but it takes technical expertise. Each procedure has steps and it's just, you have to go one step at a time through the procedure to get the good result that you need. But the patient's safety is always number one. And that's all I really care about, getting through a procedure successfully, but taking care of the patient safely. What kind of procedures do you think the next generation of interventional cardiologists will be doing? I think the next generation of interventional cardiologists, I think there will be different tracks. There'll be the coronary peripheral track. There'll be the structural heart disease, the aortic valve people, the mitral valve people, and the left atrial appendage closure. I think there'll be different tracks and, and the training will take people down different tracks. So when you are doing your interventional cardiology, are you also training residents? I train third and fourth year interventional cardiology fellows. And then they go out into the world and hopefully do the kind of work that you're doing. Right now, actually, they're, they're, after the, they spend time with me and at Jefferson Abington, uh, they're going out and doing another two years. Complete their fellowship? To complete their fellowship, it, to track out into structural heart disease or track into coronary artery disease and peripheral disease. You've told us earlier in the show some of the signs and symptoms of a possible cardiac event. Uh, let's say some of those things occur uh, and we do what we're supposed to do and we immediately go to a hospital by some means, right? Take me through what happens to a patient when they present to the emergency department with a principal complaint of chest pain. I would ask the audience if they're having significant discomfort in their chest, call 911. Don't have your wife or friend bring you to the hospital. If you're having severe discomfort in your chest, call 911. If something is out of sorts in your body, call the emergency squad. If someone gets to the emergency room uh, with chest pain, promptly they will have an EKG. The emergency room doctor will look at that EKG immediately and be able to see are there changes that are concerning for ischemic heart disease, 
acute ischemia? Is that patient having chest pain of a cardiac sort? Is there a blockage? And if there is, they will call the cardiologist immediately. Okay. And that EKG will be securely chatted into my phone and I'll see that immediately within minutes. And will he'll know generally and I'll know generally is this a cardiac problem? Does the patient look sick? Are the symptoms concerning? The EKG concerning? And immediately a cath alert will be called. And that means 24 hours a day in multiple hospitals around this region uh, that a cath lab during working hours is all the people are there, but on off hours, people will immediately come in, get in their cars, drive the 15 to 30 minutes because everyone usually lives within 30 minutes of a hospital. That's a requirement to, to be in a cath lab. And that patient will be hustled from the emergency room up into the cardiac catheterization laboratory where it's all set up for the patient to get on the table and start a procedure under sterile conditions where most likely from the radial artery will be able to, if you feel your pulse here in the radial artery, right. will be able to go up into the heart, find out if there's a narrowing or blockage promptly within minutes and see what that anatomy is, where the, where the narrowing is in particular, and deal with it with a coronary stent. Unstable angina, that's a heart attack. Uh, that's an emergency situation and we try from the time the patient arrives to the hospital or into the EMS squad car to balloon time, the time that the artery is open, we want that time to be under 90 minutes, preferably in the range of 60, 70 minutes. Right. What's the significance because of that? Time is muscle. So the sooner you get to that heart muscle and open up and restore normal flow, the cells that are starving for oxygen get oxygenated blood in there, they're more happy. And there's a smaller area of damage. A smaller area of damage. All right, and then I assume better heart function thereafter. Over time, yes. Okay. And even if there's a heart attack today when there's a lot of damage, or, yeah, or the heart is dysfunctional, on day one or two. If you got there promptly, over the next three, six, eight weeks, as like any other bruise in our body, as it heals, we generally get back to normal. And the heart may very well may get back to normal if you get there promptly. What do you want your legacy to be? I want my children and grandchildren to be healthy and happy. And I know that when my career is finished, that I will have helped thousands and thousands of people live better and longer as a result. If I get acknowledged for it, great. If I don't, it doesn't matter. I know, I know every day that I've done the best that I can for people. That's enough. Well, it sounds like you do amazing work and we're very appreciative that you and others like you are doing that. Life-saving work, really, when you think about it. But I think we are all better off if we take your advice and begin living a heart-healthy lifestyle and avoid having to have invasive cardiology to begin with. It matters. I mean, people can really take care of themselves. They can eat healthy. They can exercise. They can see their doctors at an earlier point in time and don't show up on someone's doorstep feeling ill uh, emergently at age 50, 55. That's just not right. It's not necessary. Well, hopefully uh, some of those who are watching today uh, take your advice to heart and take care of their heart. Pleasure talking yeah, to you. Yeah, Dr. Freshy, it was a pleasure. Pleasure talking to you, my friend. And to our viewers, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.